Hello, and welcome to Zoe Shorts, the bite-sized podcast where we discuss one topic around science and nutrition. I'm Jonathan Wolfe, and as always, I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Berry. And today's subject is high cholesterol foods. Cholesterol in our food has a really bad reputation, I think, and many people think of it as a bad thing. But like many of the foods and nutrients we discuss here, it's not quite as simple as that. And cholesterol can actually be found in every cell of our body, and we actually need it to be able to function normally. And in this episode, we want to find out which foods are high in cholesterol and whether it matters if we eat them or not. You'll also notice that this is a word I find hard to say, so spot how many times I say it wrong. Fortunately, I find it quite easy to say the word cholesterol because it's something I've researched for about 20 years. Um, Perfect. And I actually think there's quite a clear answer to this one as well, Jonathan. Excellent, so let's get into it. So let's start with what is cholesterol? So you said cholesterol is essential to the normal function of our bodies, but when we think of it, many, will cons many of our listeners will consider it to have a bad reputation. In fact, some of our listeners may even be on medication like statins to reduce their cholesterol. So before we delve any deeper, what actually is it, Sarah? Yeah, so Jonathan, cholesterol is a waxy substance and it's made uh, in our liver and our bodies need it to make ourselves and to produce vitamin D, for example, bile acids and hormones. Um, and as well as making cholesterol in our liver, we can also get cholesterol from our diet. And our bodies have a really complex but very uh, good process that maintains the balance of cholesterol in our blood. So this is another one of those things, you know, like carbs or something where people are like, oh, this is really bad. And then it turns out that we all have it and it plays an essential role inside our body. And reality, you know, is more complicated than, than the first picture. Is, is that right, Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. And when we refer to cholesterol as being good or bad, we're referring to the cholesterol that's circulating in our blood. So we're not referring um, in this scenario to the cholesterol that we get from our food, which we call dietary cholesterol. And most of the cholesterol in our blood is actually produced by our liver. And it's this cholesterol that's released from the liver to move around the body in your blood in little packets, which we call lipoproteins. Um, and many people think of these lipoproteins um, as cholesterol. Now, there's two types of, or two main types of lipoproteins. One is LDL, and this is what we refer to as our bad cholesterol. And very simply put, it transports cholesterol from your liver around your body. The other type is HDL, and this we call your good cholesterol. And again, in really simple terms, what this does is return cholesterol from your body to your liver in order for it to be broken down again. Got it. So high levels of HDL cholesterol keeps our risk of heart disease low. As we know, our body is actually removing the cholesterol, but if we have high levels of LDL, like that's the bad cholesterol, then this can contribute to things like hardening of the arteries, heart disease, and lots of other diseases, which I know you've been studying for many years, Sarah, in terms of the link from food through to how this happens. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's a quite a simplistic way of saying what's happening, but you're correct um, overall in that summary. Now, for many years, though, the general consensus was that if we wanted to lower our blood cholesterol levels, that we should actually make considerable efforts to reduce the amount of cholesterol that we were consuming so that we should try and reduce our dietary cholesterol in order to reduce our blood cholesterol levels. So Sarah, you said that our bodies make all the cholesterol we need, uh, but what about foods that are high in cholesterol? So, you know, as I think you know, my dad was diagnosed with high cholesterol in his 30s, and this was, you know, 40 years ago, and the doctors in America at that time advised him to move to a very low fat diet and a diet that was very low in cholesterol, um, which meant that he had to move out of all of those foods and as a result ended up eating lots of um, carbohydrates, highly processed carbohydrates. And of course that, that happened to our diet as, as well. Yeah, and that's the part of, of the problem with the advice that was given that there was a move um, for people to consume these low, low cholesterol, low fat and highly processed um, uh, diets. Now, we know that the cholesterol that we eat actually has a very small role 
on the cholesterol that circulates in our blood. Now, typically the foods that we know are high in cholesterol mostly come from animal sources, so do contain a high amount of saturated fat, and these include red meats, pork, chicken, shellfish, butter, um, and cheese, but there's also eggs as well. And so what about eggs? Um, you know, I know they are sort of the poster child of a food that's associated with high cholesterol, and they were definitely always a naughty treat at home when I was growing up. Yeah, so for a long time, Jonathan, eggs has been thought to be bad for your heart because of their cholesterol content. And just to give you an idea of the kind of amount of cholesterol in an egg, a large egg contains around 200 milligrams uh, of cholesterol. And 200 milligrams sounds like a lot. So I guess that explains why my dad felt that eating an egg was actually naughtier than ice cream. However, I think looking at the latest science, it's clear that we don't really believe in this science and in this advice anymore. Yeah, so I think that in the last decade, research has shown that at normal intakes of around 300 milligrams a day, which is uh, the typical intake uh, in most of the US or the UK, that dietary cholesterol actually has very, very little influence on a blood a person's blood cholesterol level. And I think this is another great example of how much the latest nutritional advice has changed from what we were told in the past. Um, and I think that actually leads into what you said in earlier episodes, Sarah, that you know no food is entirely good or bad. So we know that eggs are an excellent source of protein. They've got lots of healthy fat. They've also got lots of vitamins and minerals because they're sort of, you know, I think Tim had said this is probably a bit like a, a nut, right? That's actually going to ultimately feed, in this case, a little chick instead of uh, grow a tree. If that means that, you know, for people like me, with very poor blood sugar control, but actually really quite good blood fat control, eggs can actually, I think, be a great part of the diet. Um, and if eggs have been redeemed, does that mean that actually we no longer need to worry about any of the other foods that are high in cholesterol? And you talked about, you know, these red meats and things like this. For many years, the dietary guidelines for Americans have recommended keeping cholesterol intake from our food, so the dietary cholesterol at low, so to no more than about 300 milligrams per day. And that's equivalent, based on what I've just told you, to about one and a half eggs per day. But large studies and many studies that have gone on to look at this actually do not find a conclusive link between the amount of cholesterol that we're eating in our diet and circulating bad cholesterol, so the LDL, and also the risk of heart disease. Now, what we also know is when you eat foods with cholesterol, the levels in your blood do go up, but as a result, your body actually changes the amount it produces. So I think overall, we know that increasing dietary cholesterol alone is not associated with increased heart disease risk. And actually, as a reflection of this, in 2015, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans actually removed the 300 milligram per day recommendation. And we all know it takes a long time to change guidelines, but the fact they've made that shift shows you pretty conclusively, right, that the science has, has really concluded that this whole guidance about focusing on cholesterol in, in food is, is not something that's really believed in. So all of this information might come as a surprise to, to some of the audience, and many of you, like me, might feel better about enjoying eggs regularly in their diet. But what if we have been diagnosed with high cholesterol? What can we do about it? So... Um, Again, we looked at the latest advice. It turns out that there may be some significant ways in which we can reduce cholesterol in our blood that don't require medication or a change in diet. So there's some research that's been published recently showing that quitting smoking can improve HDL cholesterol levels. Uh, and apparently within a year of quitting, your, your risk of heart disease is half that of a smoker. Uh, and apparently we also know that increasing your physical activity, losing weight and dietary changes can reduce the level of that cholesterol in your blood. What about specifically thinking about dietary changes, Sarah? Yeah, so I think the best evidence to illustrate just how effective food and a whole dietary pattern change can be at lowering cholesterols comes from the portfolio studies. Um, and this constitutes a dietary pattern that focuses on four key elements. So there's four key components of this portfolio, and these are soy protein, plant sterols, tree nuts, and soluble fiber. And this portfolio uh, style dietary approach has been shown to reduce cholesterol by up to 30%. And this is actually similar to the kind of reduction that we see in cholesterol from people taking statins, which are the drugs amazing. that uh, you know, are often given to lower cholesterol. Um, and Jonathan, this is because the, the specific components of each of these four parts of the portfolio actually separately have quite a reasonable effect on circulating uh, blood cholesterol. Now, 
one thing to say is that the portfolio diet isn't really very easy to follow diet it's a fantastic proof of principle that you know i use when i'm teaching students about how diet can modify cholesterol but it is quite hard for the majority of people to follow so more realistic diet that can be followed and that we know is really effective in lowering cholesterol is the mediterranean diet and we know that there's a, there's a very broad range of what a Mediterranean diet is, but all of these tend to be much gut healthier than the sort of typical diet um, uh, that, that we have. You know, to sort of come to conclusion out of all of this, it seems that um, in the past, dietary cholesterol was considered to be a bad thing. Um, but from what we've discussed today, am I right in thinking that, you know, our opinions have really changed significantly? There has been a change in opinion and several large scale studies have come to the conclusion there isn't a clear link between dietary cholesterol and an increased risk of heart disease. Um, now, I do also have always have to caveat that, Jonathan, by saying within reasonable intakes, obviously, if someone was to go and um, consume 30 eggs a day or, you know, kilos and kilos of shellfish, uh, which we know is high in cholesterol or, or on a daily basis, then you might see a, an increased uh, risk. Something else, though, also to caveat is that foods that are high in cholesterol also tend to be high in saturated fat and we know that this can have quite a big impact on how much bad so the ldl cholesterol um, that is produced by your body got it and so many of these foods you know it turns out still we're not saying a great few and this is again this is like your you know your meats and things like this that actually you know it might not be the dietary cholesterol that is the problem but there's other things in those foods that mean that we're still um not positive but then i think you gave these great examples not only of eggs but things like sort of fermented dairy and cheeses and things like this that actually you know we now think are um uh you know quite beneficial having previously been in this thing of like oh you absolutely mustn't touch it if you're worrying about heart disease yeah, and I think as well, it's important to remember for the majority of people, you know, the amount of cholesterol that we're consuming as a population. So if we take the UK and the US, there's not many of us actually consuming above 300 milligrams. And actually, in general, the research would show intakes even up to 700 milligrams don't seem to have a long term unfavorable effect anyway. And this seems like a yet another example where um, in the past sort of we became too obsessed by the idea of individual nutrients. We're trying to discover like this one thing that's a problem. And so people got obsessed by cholesterol. And now it's really clear that, you know, that none of these individual nutrients are that important. We need to understand sort of the whole food, which is, you know, we now understand right across our food, these, you know, 20,000 plus different different chemicals. And it feels like, you know, this is definitely one of those examples where we got really obsessed by this um, and, and got, you know, went down a pretty bad, um, you know, bad avenue before we have reversed back out of it. Yeah, and I think it's also a, a culprit of the complexity of, of food as well, because like I said, you know, most high cholesterol foods are also high in saturated fat. And it's very difficult as researchers to tease apart the parts, the different components or the different chemicals in food and what is impacting different downstream health effects. And this is why certainly for myself as a nutritional scientist, the advice I would always give to people is please don't focus on a single nutrient, focus on foods, focus on whole dietary patterns. And this is a perfect example of this. Don't focus on the cholesterol, don't focus on the saturated fat. Think about the types of food that you're eating instead. I think that's right. And I, I think the final thing that I think it really makes clear again is that we've been in, in this world where we've, we've sort of had this view there's this complete divide between carbs and fat. Um, and I think it's not by chance, right, that people were were saying, oh, these are these people, they've got heart disease risks, you know, they've got these elevated levels of fats in their blood. Well, clearly you shouldn't eat, you know, fats, you shouldn't eat cholesterol. And actually, you know, it turns out that our body is what a surprise after billions of years of evolution, right? Incredibly good at moving these things around. And so if you get rid of all these fats, you know what? Your body just goes and creates the fat, right? It turns the carbs into fat or it creates the cholesterol as, you, as you're talking about. Um, and so it turns out that you can have, you know, high levels of these blood fats, you know, even from eating a very low fat diet. And it seems like it took us a long time to really fully recognize that. And even today, I think people are having these, you know, strong arguments about, you know, you should have 
no carb or you should eat you know low fat or whatever and and it seems clear i think talking to all the different scientists that we get to talk to that this is um it doesn't really make sense that the reality is much more about the quality of these individual foods not about sort of macronutrients yeah and i think as well it's important to remember just how clever our bodies are um so as our dietary cholesterol intake increases the amount produced by the liver reduces and i think we often you know demonize foods or nutrients without due respect for actually just how clever we are as human beings in actually adapting a lot to the kind of foods and the kind of nutrients we're eating i think it's a beautiful place to wrap up sarah thank you as always for helping us through a very complicated topic uh, and if you've been listening to this uh, and you'd like to try zoe's personalized nutrition program to understand the right foods for you in order to improve your health and manage your weight you can get 10 percent off by going to joinzoe.com slash podcast i'm jonathan wolf and i'm sarah berry Join us next week for another Zoe podcast. <laughs>